Author Alex Segura has made a name for himself in the suspense genre as the author of the acclaimed Pete Fernandez detective fiction series, while keeping one foot in the world of comic books. He's currently a senior vice president at the graphic novel publisher Oni Press and has previously worked at DC Comics and Archie Comics. His own comic books include stints writing The Archies and the graphic novel The Black Ghost. In Alex's highly anticipated new novel, Secret Identity, he combines his love of comics with his mastery of the literary thriller. Set in the flailing comic industry of 1975, Secret Identity is a wildly entertaining genre-bending story of secrets and superheroes and features graphic novel art sequences throughout the book by artist Sandy Jarrell. For today's conversation, Alex chats with New York Times best-selling crime fiction writer Laura Lipman, creator of the Tess Monahan Private Eye series, hit standalone mysteries like Lady in the Lake and Sunburn, and the personal essay collection, My Life as a Villainess. I'm good. I'm so I was I've been looking forward to this for some time. So thanks. Thanks for doing it. It's, uh, I'm, it's a I'm thrill. I'm excited about it. I've thought a lot about this conversation. And I want to start by saying you're born in 1980, right? Yeah. That right. So the events of secret identity are taking place primarily five years before you exist. Yeah. yeah. So, I wasn't even an idea yet. So tell me, tell me about you and how the you that you are in elegant phrase becomes the person who wants to write a book about the comic world set in New York City in 1975? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I was born in Miami. My parents were Cuban. They came over right after Castro took over. Obviously, they didn't know each other. So my mom, my mom's birthday was actually January, is January 1st. And so as the revolution was kind of happening, she remembers her birthday party being kind of shut down because that's kind of when Castro entered, I guess, Havana. Um, and I grew up in Miami, which was, I always tell people this, that I didn't really get a sense of other or feeling like not, you know, you know, apart from the mainstream until I moved to New York because they're, you know, the Cuban community in Miami is so large and so all consuming and in the best way possible, just culturally, you felt like you were just in an extension of probably what Cuba was like to some. Um, my introduction to comics was in a grocery store line. My mom bought me an Archie comic and I think she did it because I was under the weather and she wanted to give me something to read. And that really opened the door. I mean, it was just like that blend of visuals and, and story and this kind of idyllic Americana that I wasn't really familiar with, like, you know, this you know, seasons and just going to school and uh, winter and, and, you know, just the kind of pristine life of Riverdale, I guess. And um, you know, and then I graduated to more, you know, very much like Carmen in the book, like to more superhero stuff. And I have fond memories of going to the store with my dad and like picking out the comics and, and uh, you know, budgeting my money and seeing what I could buy at the newsstand and then what I could get at the comic shop. Um, and that was a lifelong, that just became an obsession to me, like just those characters and drawing those characters and writing about those characters and writing my own characters. And um, at the same time, I loved science fiction and you know, probably true crime and crime fiction at too young an age. Like I remember picking The Godfather off my grandfather's shelf and reading it probably at way too young because I mean, that book is just as so much pulpier than the movies ever were. And just oh like a lot of, yeah, definitely not a uh, PG, um, but it became just part of my identity in its own way, just comics. And, and um, I moved to New York I moved to New York twice. I moved up to work in a magazine in Rockland County thinking I was moving to the big city and Rockland County is not the, <laughs> very not Manhattan-like. Um, 
very suburban. I saw snow for the first time, but I got to work in comics and I got to blend my, I thought my career then was going to be as a journalist because I was doing a lot of reporting and a lot of copy editing. And I thought I would blend that with comics. And I worked at this magazine, Wizard Magazine, which is now defunct. Um, but it was basically like the EW of the comic book industry. And um, that was my introduction to the people behind the credits, you know, like the, the creators and the editors and the company. Um, and then I moved back to Miami as, as we all do in our own way. You kind of like fold up and, and go back to the warm weather and, um, and I, I went back to the newspaper and I started reviewing comics for the newspaper, like just graphic novel reviews for Connie Ogle, who I think, who you know, oh, right? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Of course. So, so she had me reviewing graphic novels for the Herald and I ended up chatting with my contact at DC Comics and I said, I'm going to be up there on vacation. Just, I'd love to take a tour of the offices. And he said, would you like to apply for a job? <laughs> so that, you know, that day I got there, I had to go shop for a suit and kind of prep for these interviews and I ended up getting this job in the publicity department. And, um, and so I was back, except this time I was in the big city and I was, you know, the dream had become my job, which was interesting. I think it's interesting in a, in a, wow, this is great way, but also interesting in a, can you make this a job way as opposed to this thing that you do for fun in your spare time. And so the comics I probably would have bought for fun now became almost a homework assignment. And so, um, that's when I found myself drifting to back to mystery novels. And I was reading, you know, your work and, and George Pelicanos and Dennis Lehane and Larry Block and Michael Connolly and, and just kind of immersing myself in that as a way to have a hobby and do something that wasn't, you know, required or work-wise. One of the things that struck me about reading this secret identity is that you were clearly prepared for one group of readers, which would be the snobs, the people who are like, oh, comics. Yeah. But something that I think about a lot, because I fall into a different category as someone who actually finds the comics world as it, as it is now really formidable. It's like, especially when people talk about the, the Marvel universe, does it ever occur to you that there are people that we need we need to win them over to, to secret identity because it's just such a fantastic book. And we need to assure people that you can love comics, not love comics, aspire to love comics, but feel overwhelmed. And and that this book should work for everyone, right? This should because it's about it's about the comic industry in 1975. And I'd like you to explain what the comic industry was like in 1975. Yeah, I think one of the reasons, the main reason I picked 1975 was because it's so different from the comic book world we see today. Like, like you were saying, like, everyone knows these characters now, and not even through comics, like people know WandaVision, because they watched the show, or yeah, right. or, or they know the Guardians of the Galaxy, because they saw the movie, or they know all these Avengers characters, but they don't necessarily buy the comics, which is fine. It's just, it's saturation, and that's great. But in 1975, I think comics as a medium at least superhero comics were dying. And I think there was this sense that it was a fading, like a Titanic type situation, you know, you couldn't, there was no aftermarket, you know, you, the things that people do today where they collect every issue and they buy them as they come out, there was no system in place for that. You went to the newsstand and if Spider-Man was there, you picked up Spider-Man. And if not, you picked up Superman. And, um, I think the makeup of the people working in comics were super fans like Carmen, people that grew up reading comics and wanted to make them because they had a passion. And then there was a percentage of people that were just kind of doing it to buy time before they got something real. Like they wrote their real novel or they wrote a TV show or they did something else or got into publishing. Um, and nobody was thinking about owning their IP or think, you know, phrases that we, we talk about so much today, like owning their IP, getting stuff optioned. It was just, you got paid a page rate and you drew the comic or you wrote the script and then you moved on to the next thing and, and that was that. It was very transient and it was very much work for hire and very much pay as you go. There was no royalties or sense of, of publishing or traditional publishing. And um, I wanted to show that because I think people expect comics to be what they are today. But there was a time when comics were dying and people didn't really see it as as an art form. And Carmen is in contrast to that idea because she does see it as an art form and treats it as an art form. And, and I love her as a character for that because she comes in so prepared and so like ready to go. Um, and I think um, 
I really wanted to contrast what people see comics as today, because like you said, and, and I think one of the challenges for me was, and Zach, my editor was so helpful in this. He was like, you don't want to get into the Wikipedia of it. You know, you don't want to over explain. You want someone to come in who maybe doesn't know comics and be intrigued and say, oh, I'm going to look this name up or I'm going to read this book, but not feel like you're getting like the bio on every name that's dropped. And so and it's something that Megan, Megan Abbott does really well, and, and you do really well, where you immerse someone in a world, but you you don't overburden them with information. You know, you're there, and and you absorb it, and you kind of get a taste for it, but you're not you're not getting the one on one in a tutorial way. It's fascinating because you do learn a lot about how a comic is made, and I was interested in those kind of details. I wondered how much research you had to do about the '70s comics industry because it has to be so different from the industry that you entered, you know, barely 15 years ago. I went into it thinking it wouldn't be that research intensive. And it ended up being like the most research intensive and the most like journalistic book I've ever written in that, you know, I mean, Carmen, we have a lot of similarities, but you know, we're different. So I wanted to speak to women that worked in comics at the time. I wanted to speak to editors that worked in the industry at the time. And I did a lot of reading and rereading of just history books because it's a very unique period because like I said, comics weren't really the media giant they are now. So there was not a lot of oversight. So if you wanted to go in and really alter a character and do something crazy, no one was really kind of managing you yet because there were no toys, there were no movies, there were no TV, aside from the Batman show in the sixties, there were no media demands or corporate synergy or things like that, things that are now so commonplace, but you could go in and write a character and really put your stamp on it. And so I wanted to give that sense of Wild West. And and I, yeah, I didn't expect to have to do the, the kind of legwork I ended up doing, but that was also really fun too. Now I'm going to go to the place to talk about your amazing, wonderful main character, Carmen. And I was so struck by the fact that in your um, after note that you actually talked about sensitivity readers. Mm -hmm. I'm for some yeah. people, some people get a little bit, they kind of get their panties in a bunch about it. Like, Oh God, everybody's so woke. <laughs> so here's the thing. We both know that in crime fiction, there have been men in recent years who have been writing female characters under gender blurring names. Right. Say. And they complain about it. And some of them are like, I have to do this because otherwise I, as a white man, cannot get a book published. It's like, you know. Oh, God. Yeah. I mean, you know, so I, you know, so in that world, this could not be more opposite where we have a character, female. It's like, it's, it's so obvious has to be a story about a woman. I mean, I don't know how yeah. you write this book. Um, and whether she has to have Carmen's sexuality, who knows, but it has to be a story about a woman. And right. I was really struck by the fact that you said this story has been kicking around for a long time for you. Like how long, when did, when did secret identity first come to you? The first time the thought struck me was in college. I was reading, and this is before I even thought I would be a novelist or be a writer of any kind. I mean, I always wanted to be, but you know, the reality is so different when you, the path, but I read Cavalier and Clay, Michael Chabon's fantastic novel about comics. Yeah. And um, I remember reading it and thinking, I really wish he had comics in this. Like, I love the world he painted, but I wanted to read the Escapist comics. And um, and they eventually did that as kind of like an addendum to the publishing. And, and it was fun, but that's when the idea started to percolate. And a lot of Carmen's story parallels my experience, you know, coming into comics as a marketing person or someone outside of the story part but wanting to be part of the story, wanting to be creative. And, and I had the benefit of seeing so many talented writers as their publicists, like people like Greg Rucka or, you know, Brad Meltzer and, um, and just kind of seeing how they did it. And, and they were very helpful to me along the way. And Carmen didn't have that because I don't think at that time in comics that existed, there was no framework for like mentoring. Um, and I think at one point her boss says, look, I can just give, it would look weird for me to give my secretary work because that was rife in comics at the time, you know, like spouses or secretaries doing work so they can have a woman be part of the story. But um, yeah, I think in terms of Carmen being different, I mean, we have so much in common. She's Cuban American, she's in comics, but you know, we're different. She's a woman, yeah. I'm a man. And 
I wanted to be transparent and thoughtful about that because I don't really know how else to do that. I mean, why, like, why pretend you're doing something else? And, and, uh, and that's when sensitivity readers became so important because I just wanted to make sure I was at least in the ballpark. I wasn't trying to tell a definitive tale of, you know, her experience, but I wanted to know that I was at least doing it thoughtfully and as correctly as I could. Early in Secret Identity, I found myself thinking, I don't really care if anybody dies in this book. Oh, good. <laughs> because it, we talk about stakes all the time. And, you know, there, 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 are, there are crimes in this book that are scary and frightening and mm. need to be investigated and solved. But it's as much the story about Carmen and her quest at work to be taken yeah. seriously and about the you know, you really feel like the stakes are as much about Carmen at work and this amazing super character, superhero character, yeah, the Lynx, yeah. whom I adored. And I was like, oh, wow, I I wish there were Lynx comics. Will there be? <laughs> I think so. I, you know, honestly, while we were making them, Sandy, the artist, and I, you know, you can't just make a sample of a comic. You have to kind of think right. it through. And we thought of the, we create, you know, I created the character and Sandy came up with the visuals. And as we were doing these sequences, we just kept saying, we should just make this a comic. Like there's gotta be a comic. So I think at some point there's gonna be because it just, all the stuff is there and it would be such a fun little weird anachronistic thing. To, It'll be oh, a, I, seven, I, a 70s comic, right? It'll yeah, be we'd have to 70s. treat it like some some lost yeah. comic from the 70s. Yeah. But um, I'm so glad you pointed that out because for me, it was so much more about atmosphere and I was reading a ton of Highsmith and just thinking about, you know, the, she she paints pictures and she shows you these very conflicted characters, but there's not a ton of like, cars don't blow up. I mean, they do, but not in the same way. I didn't want it to feel like a thriller is my point. I didn't want it to feel like some high octane plot thing. Yeah, it, it, it really neatly and wonderfully sidesteps some tropes that are perfectly fine. Yeah, <laughs> I'd like, oh, it would be fine if, Carmen was the number one suspect and she had to clear her name. It would be fine. There, yeah. And there are other things like that. There are other places where you're like, oh, it would be fine if it had to go down that road. But it was exciting because it didn't. And the way time passes in the novel felt mm -hmm. more true to life. Like, you know, oh, some, months, some months would go by and nothing happened. <laughs> like, yeah, know? I mean, just like in real life, like things just didn't happen. And I wanted to... I didn't want the, I wanted the elements of noir, you know, in that she's cornered and she has to make a tough decision and she has to kind of dig herself out of this hole, but I didn't want it to be because she was somehow malicious or did something, you know, you know, she didn't make a terrible choice and then have to make up for it. She just had to make up for someone else's terrible choice, Harvey's terrible choice to kind of throw her mm -hmm. under the bus basically. But I didn't want the cop trope because there's always a cop in a noir story that comes in and starts sniffing around. I didn't want the cop to be just a bumbling nobody i wanted you know hudson to figure out well carmen you look like you might be a suspect but you're not you know i know better i i'm smart enough to know that and so um yeah i you know i i wanted to honor the stuff that came before but also give it a, enough of a twist to make it interesting because it's the book you write the book you want to read i guess that's so trite to say but it's true i mean I, I wrote a book that i wanted to read something that was hard when i got to the end of this book is best i can tell you have written a book that there can't be any more stories about Carmen. You see, I mean, I mean, maybe you could, but I felt like, oh, this feels a little more closed off than I thought it was going to be. And I'm not sure how I feel about that. I know it's, I was, it was really hard to write, not to spoil anything to write that. There's an epilogue that kind of tidies it up. And I think I can say that, but I mean, there's still the, I'd like to say that I closed the door, but I left it a little ajar. You know, there's a little wiggle room if I want to do something. It just won't, I don't want it to be through the decades with Carmen. You know, I don't, I don't want to do comics in the eighties with Carmen or comics in the nineties with Carmen. Like I wanted to give her an off ramp and then maybe she can kind of circle around at some point. I am curious about your next up project. What will you be doing next? Whatever um, it is. I actually, I think we can probably say, cause this will air after it's going to be announced, but I'm, we are writing another Carmen book. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, but it's not, it's you, you nailed it in that she's not the star she's in the book and it's kind of, there's a different protagonist. It's set in the modern day and hopefully it's 
different enough that it doesn't, you know, my fear with any kind of sequel is that people are just going to think, well, I have to read Secret Identity to understand this book. And it's, oh, no, no. it's its own thing. It's its own thing. And Carmen happens to be in it. And it's, it's kind of a comment in the way that Secret Identity is a meta commentary in its own way on IP and character ownership. This is like the modern, it's the other side of the coin. It's like, what would happen now? Was it a big ask or did your editor, Zach, who's wonderful, did he understand from the very beginning that, yes, we have to have excerpts from the links in this book? Because that's, so, that's not a small thing to have no. pages of a graphic novel. And they're beautiful. Like I was like, oh, I would hang this art in my home. I there's love one it. up here. I think there's, I mean, you probably can't see it, but that middle thing is the, is the, the page we used um, when we pitched it to Zach. I have to say, Zach, Zach and I have been talking about this book off and on since... I think before BoucherCon in Dallas. Like, wow. I was, I knew that was going to be my next book. I think Miami Midnight had just been nominated for Best Novel, and that was the last Pete book. And I was going to do this Star Wars thing as kind of a fun, like, how do you say no to Star Wars? It was just a fun detour. Um, and it was the last day before I was, I was heading to the airport. So I stopped to have breakfast at the hotel uh, restaurant, and Zach shows up and we're chatting. And I said, this is uncouth of me but this is my next book. And I think you would probably be great for it. <laughs> like, and he was just like, keep me posted. And I could tell he didn't mean it in a polite, like, please go away. He was very much, cause he's a comic fan and he know, and he, he edits the kind of books I wanted to write. And so that's where the dance kind of started. And I wrote a big chunk of the novel and outlined the rest, but I had Sandy do a spec page. Um, and we had it lettered and everything because I wanted to show proof of concept and that he was and then Zach was was into it, you know, and and he's been just such an invaluable part of the whole process. I think I'm right in thinking that you're fairly active with crime writers of color. Yeah. And I think that's a really important group in our genre. And that. Well, I would like to hear from you, like looking ahead over the next five to 10 years. Like, so obviously I'm in the position of trying to be what we call a good ally. Mm -hmm. And what is it that in crime fiction in particular and secret identity falls very squarely within traditional crime fiction in the best possible way? What should we be doing as readers and writers to make sure that crime fiction is as rich and diverse as the country we actually live in. I'm, I'm really curious to think what, what I can do as a reader, what I can do as a writer and what we can all be doing. I think the big challenge, and I think I have this fear on a micro level and I think we all have it. There's a wave of writers and I think, you know, someone like Kelly Garrett or Gigi Pandian, like writers that, you know, we've kind of done our time in the small presses and are now seeing our first books in the mainstream in the, you know, in, in terms of the big five. Um, I think our worry, and I don't mean to speak for them, I think the worry is like, is this a trend? Like, is this something that's happening now? And then if those books don't break out, does this mean that that'll be it, you know, and it's happened. I say that because it's happened before. There've been kind of upticks in- Yeah, diverse... and actually it, it happened in the nineties. Yeah. And you so, saw these writers caught the wave and then all of a sudden, oh, we're back to Walter Mosley. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. And I mean, I, I think the challenge for readers is to buy, you know, buy and read outside of your experience and buy and read from people that, you know, I love crime fiction because it takes me to places I will never go and in the minds of people I will never be. And I love that. And I think more readers need to just kind of open themselves up to that. And I think authors, I try to amplify authors of every level, you know, like big name authors that I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of or new authors. And I think if your percentage of promotion is 80, 20 in favor of plugging your own book, then I would probably try to find some balance and use that extra space to promote other authors and authors from marginalized communities and, you know, that aren't getting the bandwidth that they should be getting because it's an uphill climb. And it's, and I, and I hope the trend doesn't, isn't a trend. I hope it's just like, this is the new normal, but I'm still in that moment of waiting to see. You know? I mean, I'm encouraged across pop culture in general to see that right now, there does seem to be an interest in diversity that doesn't feel trend-like. I mean, the horrible thing to say is that one of the, the best things 
to help things happen is capitalism. Yeah. And so if people feel like they're being enriched by offering, you know, more diverse books and film and television, then it tends to happen more and more. And I feel like right now, especially I think in television right now, it feels like it's moved beyond trend. Yeah, and I would say so. I think we're still in the kind of shaky phase with crime fiction. And I think my worry also is also the expectation of writing your trauma, like this expectation that because you're from mm-hmm. a marginalized community that your books have to deal with the trauma of that community. And I can write a story about, you know, the Cuban refugee crisis and that's fine, but I don't think every book has to be about that. And I'd like to sometimes write a fun little story and just that's light. I did want to end with highlighting crime writers of color because I think it's a really important group. I mean, it's as important as Sisters in Crime was when it emerged in the 80s. And we're still fighting some of those fights too, but anyway. Yeah, we see little skirmishes. I mean, sometimes Kelly and I are we're always chatting. And so we'll see something at least once a week, something where it's just like an eye roll moment where you're just like, you just want, you, you, we always, we also don't want it to be where the crime, you know, the writers of color always have to fight the battle, you know, have to be the ones that call things out because sometimes we'd like to just be authors and, and benefit from being authors and have yeah. the fun, do the fun part. <laughs> yes. That's an unfair expectation. And I think, I mean, part of what, is difficult for all of us is that the crime fiction writing community is perhaps surprisingly to people outside of it, incredibly warm and affectionate. Yeah, Everybody knows everybody and people are mostly friendly. So when it's time to fight some of these fights, it's like, but yeah, we all need to fight the fights. Yeah. It just becomes a very polite kind of debate. And I'm, I don't fight every battle. I think Kelly probably her batting average is much higher than mine in terms of just getting, (laughs) getting in the weeds. Um, But when I do, I have to be very polite because I know these people, I know both sides of it most of the time. And you just want to nudge people in the right direction. It's just such a terrific book. And the last thing I wanted to note about it though, is something that made me laugh in a really good way is when I was looking at your bio at the book, most of us talk about having a day job if we still have one. But you don't call it a day job. You wrote by day. And, you, and I was like, yes, Alex has reminded me that for those of us, and I don't anymore, but when you have a job and your writing life, instead of thinking of it as day job, which makes it sound drudgery, think of it as what you do by day so yeah. that you can be a superhero at night. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, I love my day. I love the fact that I can be in the publishing industry in a different way. And I don't know if I would ever not have that. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to predict anything, but I, I think it's just fun to have this dual identity and it's, it, it makes life interesting and uh, I'm never bored. <laughs> I think that's a perfect place to, for us to end because no one reading secret identity will ever be bored. So I hope wonderful so. book. Uh, this has been an honor because like, you know, I've, I've gushed to you about how much your books mean to me. So thank you so much for taking the time and I'm glad you liked it. That's like the win. 